And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven. Now, if you recall, there were many angels throughout the previous chapters. So if there was another angel that arrived, there were previous angels before him. Where can you find that? Well, where you can find it concerning the previous angels is when you read from Revelation 6 and onward, if you give more time to the tribulation, see that, rather than limiting to three and a half years, this could make a lot more sense. There were other angels present that time. So I see more and more when I look at scripture that you have to give it more time. You have to give it more time. Now, if we see over here another angel flying in the midst of heaven, so he's flying in the middle of heaven, what's he giving? Having the everlasting gospel. There's a gospel that's either everlasting, eternal. To what? Preach unto them that dwell on the earth. So it's for everybody around the world. And to every nation, and kindred, and tongue, and people. So it's for every nation, every tribe, see different groups of people, kindred families, and tongue, different language, and people, different people. Now, notice what's based on the everlasting gospel. It's not the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. In verse 7, it's the saying with a loud voice, fear God. you got to fear him and give glory to him. Notice that you have to glory and honor him. For the hour of his judgment is come. Oh, so God's about to send his judgment again. And worship him that made heaven and earth. You got to worship God because he created everything. And the sea and the fountains of waters. So notice right over here God made heaven, he made the earth, he made the sea, and he made all sorts of water fountains. God created all that, not evolution. Amen. Okay, so make sure that you remember that. Amen. Now, if this is the gospel... Notice it's for all nations. See that? So this is for everybody. So this is not uh, limited to his uh, saved tribulation saints, you'll notice. This is for everybody around the world. Now, look at the book of Matthew. Look at the book of Matthew 25. Uh, Matthew 24, Matthew 24. Now notice that the everlasting gospel is not the same as Paul's gospel. As a matter of fact, if you look at the book of Galatians, Paul calls it my gospel. Or Paul called it. He calls it my gospel. Why would he say my gospel if this gospel was preached before? See, so this is Paul. So, undoubtedly, there's a different timeline. Well, obviously, there were other Gospels before Paul, but they're different. The future tribulation is everlasting. Now, notice that when Christ tells him to preach the Gospel, it's not Christian church. In Matthew 24. Look at verse 13. And he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Not only that, you have to endure to the end for your salvation. People who like to claim, well, this is referring to the physical salvation of the fleshly body, um, and they have an agenda. Again, it's Bible believing King James only dispensationalists and they only attack them. You better watch out for those kind of people. They are rebels who could not have learned the doctrine except us then. So the reading, so these people are reading out of all of our own materials and then trying to correct them. Because they think they're smarter. But look at this, this is not just a fleshly 
uh, rescuing. Because look at verse 14. And this what? Gospel of the kingdom. Look at that. See that? Shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. So notice over here that this gospel is going to preach throughout all the world. Now, notice that in the book of Matthew, you're going to see at verse 3, that's the end of the world. But then at verse 6, when Christ is talking about the end of the world, at verse 6 he says, the end is not yet. Why? Because Jesus Christ recognizes the timeline of the tribulation is the end, but the actual ending of that whole tribulation period is not there yet. It's the beginning of sorrows, that's what he calls it. At verse 8, all these are the beginning of sorrows. See, that's the tribulation timeline. Now, based off of this, we can see this matches with Revelation 14, where they preach the gospel throughout everywhere. So we know that this has to be a Jewish flavor. You're going to see Jewish, Jewish, Jewish. Jump to Matthew 4. Matthew 4. Now, we're coming across a lot of fun stuff in dispensationalism. A lot of interesting deep doctrines. So, let's go through this one by one. But again, I highly recommend look at my, look at my dispensational playlist. And it'll become much more clear. Because I can only go through the street. Now, the gospel of the kingdom, that was preached before Paul's gospel. That was based off of Matthew 4. That's called the Gospel of the Kingdom. See that? So look at Matthew 4. Now look at Matthew chapter 4, and then you read verse 23. The Kingdom. Now this Gospel of the Kingdom is based on what? Healing at the middle of verse 23. Look at chapter 5. This is based on Jesus Christ setting up a kingdom on the earth. See that? But what did the Jews do with their king? They rejected him, right? So to Acts 2, Paul, when he was preaching the gospel, he was giving the Jews another chance. What did the Jews do? They rejected him. So that's why the apostles and eventually God had to raise up Paul after that. That, look, we're done with you Jews, we're going to go to the Gentiles. And that's proven from the past 2,000 years of church history. So notice the Jewish flavor that matches with Matthew 4, Matthew 24, it calls it Gospel of the Kingdom, and Revelation 14, where it's called Everlasting Gospel. So this is something very interesting. So the Gospel of the Kingdom then, it's not now, it was preached to Israel to receive their king. But they rejected their king, correct? So what did God do? He had to postpone them. He didn't cast them off, he postponed it. Because he had to do this again. Right over here. See that? So he has to do this again. Because the gospel of the kingdom over here, you notice how that's distinguished from the everlasting gospel. Right? Notice the everlasting gospel is at a latter timeline. You notice that too? And then you'll notice over here that gospel of the kingdom, Jesus said the end is what? Not yet. So it's at an earlier time period. So you see more and more flavors after flavors and hints and hints where the tribulation, you would make more sense if you put some earlier time period. See that? So if you put an earlier time period, not just three and a half years, which applies to the latter time period, this can make a lot more sense. Now, once the Jews receive their king, what happens? Moses and Elijah, they start uh, baptizing people. Notice that this matches with Acts 2. Notice that Revelation 7, 
They're, they come from all over. And then you see Revelation 14, that they're preaching everywhere. So while they're preaching this gospel everywhere, they're preaching this gospel everywhere too. This proves right over here that even with different gospels, you cannot escape the fact that it is a Jewish, they all share a Jewish flavor. There is no doubt about that. Whether you argue for difference or similarity, you're going to retract to Jew, Jew, and Jew. And that's the same thing we saw our study right here, right? Whether spiritual or literal, yeah. in some cases, you're going to retreat to Jew, Jew, and Jew. So this is a very interesting book in Revelation. If you're Amen. dispensational, notice how this divides neatly. Amen. It makes more sense. Because now in the everlasting gospel, it's saying that you're supposed to fear God, and then you're also supposed to not take, you're not supposed to not worship Him. The gospel of the kingdom is simply talking about a cunning king over here. Over here, it's talking about rejecting the current king during that time. Okay, so this is very interesting over here concerning about the different gospels. That's why in Mark 16, let me close it off over here. One more dispensationalism fun, okay? Yeah, this, is, this is really fun. I covered it in my previous video, too. I showed you from Mark 16 how this debunks hyper dispensationalism. Because Mark 16 is repeating Matthew 28. Preach the gospel to what? All the world, right? And then Matthew 28 Obviously, that gospel Jesus was referring to was Matthew 24. See that? That's why it makes sense. The apostles, they are preaching about a coming kingdom. And then later, 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 Paul came to give the Christian gospel. This makes so much sense. Now, the hyper-dispensation because they see this pattern, Let's be honest, this is all Jewish, right? You see that? But, ooh, here's the goody part. What's the problem with hyper dispensational? They take away every promise from a Christian, and then they apply it to a Jew, right? So over here, you're going to see, just like Revelation 2 and 3, another application where this applies to the church. You might say, no, I don't believe that. No. Because in Mark 16, when it says preach the gospel to all the world, it mentions about baptizing them, right? Other dispensationalists do not believe Christians should be water baptized. That is heresy. It is obedience to the command at Mark 16 and Matthew 28. You might say, but that's Jewish. No, here's a simple answer. When Jesus Christ was talking about the gospel, guess what? If it's the gospel of the kingdom, right? Is there only one kingdom of God, Mr. Hyper Dispensationalist? Or do you admit there are two kingdoms? You admit there are two kingdoms, don't you? Some of you onlineers didn't know that. Kingdom of heaven, meaning a physical earthly kingdom for Jews. Watch my video about. Kingdom of heaven versus kingdom of God. There is another kingdom, which is the kingdom of God. And that is spiritual, not physical. And it is the kingdom of God offering. Yeah, because look at Romans 14. Look at the book of Ephesians. Uh, I believe 1, Colossians 1. There's so many references where the church is in the kingdom of God. Or in some form of kingdom. So how are you going to explain that one then, huh? Are you going to say the Christian church jumped to the Jewish gospel then? No, because the gospel of the kingdom consists of two kingdoms. Kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God. Now which side of the kingdom 
do you think that uh, that the Christian church came from? Kingdom of heaven or kingdom of God? Kingdom of God. Well, I don't believe that's the gospel of the kingdom of God that you put it. Look up every word that talks about kingdom of God in the Pauline epistles. That has to apply to the Christian church. So, when God was speaking, listen up now, this is the problem with people. When God speaks, especially prophecy or something doctrinal, if you think God was only thinking one person, one timeline, when he gives something out of his inspired words, you're going to guarantee teach heresy. That's the key problem with hyper-dispensationalists, revised dispensationalists, and anti-dispensationalists. They only look at one application, one application, and you know that's impossible. I taught you at the beginning chapters of Revelation. That when God speaks from his inspired words, he can apply, uh, for example, the book of Psalms. He applies it to David at his timeline. He applies it to the Jesus, the coming Messiah, at a future timeline. And if you look at the book of 2 Kings, that's even worse. Because, uh, excuse me, 1 Kings. It's even worse because when you look at the book of 1 Kings, God was talking about Solomon and he's going to be my son, but the he book of Hebrews, as I showed you at the beginning chapters of Revelation, the book of Hebrews showed that's Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. But you can't think it's only Jesus Christ. Why? Because God says he will be my son, and I'm going to chastise him. That's not chastising Jesus to on the cross. He says when he sins, yeah. when he messes up, I'm going to get him back on the right track. Don't you dare call Jesus a sinner. See, so when God speaks his word, you better look not just one, but you got to look at, could there be two? Could there be two? Double application. Now, wasn't that fun in dispensationalism? Mm -hmm. You're not a dispensationalist. You notice how you mess up in all of this? How we know this has to refer to Christians at Mark 16 and Matthew 28? It's because when God gave the apostles the command to baptize, you know what Peter did? Peter took that for not Jews, but to who? Gentiles. When you look at the later chapters of Acts, we use Cornelius and those bunch. Yeah. And those people, they were saved by faith first. Yeah. They were saved by faith first, not by baptism works. They didn't receive the Holy Ghost through baptism. All that came up later. Why? Because God was showing Peter that the time of the Gentiles is going to be different now from how I did with the Jews. And the Gentiles listened to the apostles. Paul came from the apostles, and he continued water baptism when you look at Acts 16. He says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, thou shalt be saved. What did he do after that? Don't get water baptized. No, he baptized them straightway. So that man, there's no doubt, Paul took it seriously that it applied to him too. All right. Did you have fun? All right. This is a, this is why dispensationalism is so important. Now go home and go in peace and study your Bible. Amen. Heavenly Father, I pray that you'll dismiss us now. You're blessed. Thank you so much for an amazing book that where we can study. People might complain and whine, this is complicated. But no, God says that for dividing, rightly dividing dispensationalism, it requires study, study to show thyself a proof unto God. A worker, see, not a lazy person, but a person who works hard and needeth not to be ashamed. Should be ashamed of working really hard to study your work. Verse continues, rightly divided, the world of truth. Second Timothy. In Jesus' name we pray.